Okay, welcome along ladies and gentlemen uh, to your weekly SETI seminar series. Tonight we're joined by, uh, by Mark Kaufman who's come across to us from uh, the East Coast. Uh, Mark is the author of a new book called First Contact, uh, which he's going to talk to us about tonight. Uh, he is a, works at the uh, Washington Post as a national editor and as a science writer. And he has also previously worked at the Philadelphia Inquirer. Uh, he's a journalist of uh, some 30 years of experience. This is his first book, uh, and it's published by Simon & Schuster. Uh, and as I mentioned just before, Mark is only too willing to sign copies for you uh, over on the side here. So if you'll join me uh, in welcoming Mark. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really just an absolute delight to be here. Um, especially since there are a fair number of people in the audience who I've interviewed for both my book and for stories. And I thank you, Jill and Carl and Seth and Frank, for, uh, for all the help that uh, you've given uh, over the years. Um, before I start the presentation, just let me tell you a little bit about myself and, and how this project began. Um, uh, five years ago, I knew absolutely nothing about astrobiology. Um, I was just starting as a science writer at the Post. I had done many other things. I had been a foreign correspondent a long time. Um, and uh, I, I was sent up to a, um, a journalism boot camp at MIT. Uh, the subject was the universe, uh, which we were supposed to learn about in four days. And we did indeed learn a great deal about uh, supermassive black holes and you know, uh, how galaxies form and so on, uh, all of which was fascinating. But what really grabbed me was the, uh, the last day there was a presentation by um, a young woman who perhaps many, some of you know, uh, Sarah Seeger, who um, suffice it to say uh, was given a um, it was given tenure and a name chair at age 34 uh, at MIT, an unusual thing. So she came up and she was talking, and one of the first things that she said was um, that she very firmly believed, and not only believed, she, she had concluded scientifically that in her lifetime, uh, life would be found beyond Earth. And I remember just doing a double take, not so much because I, I was not a scientist, and, and it wasn't the science of it, but it was to have someone of that level of authority in that context and you know up there at MIT saying this, I just thought, what a story. Uh, you know, this is something that, that people in the field know, apparently, and as I've, as I've learned more, uh, it, it is kind of a, a generally, uh, there is something of a consensus about that. Um, but it's something that the public, I think, does not really know. It knows it in the context of you know, you do a poll and 50% of people will say that there are aliens out there. Uh, but they don't know that the science, the really good science is being done to push that, uh, to push us forward toward an understanding that's based on something that other than what you'd like to be the case. So, that said, um, here we go. And, and you know, I've, I have now lived uh, with this uh, very intensely for three, and three years or so. I know many of you have done for much longer, and it is just such an enormous privilege. It is, it, uh, you know, what could be better? Um, quite clearly, uh, human beings, either instinctively or through some kind of desire, we want there to be life beyond Earth. Uh, you know, you look at it in terms of, you know, where are gods? Where's heaven? Uh, in different cultures, in the jinns of, uh, in Islam, uh, angels in a lot of different cultures. Um, and then in more recent times, you know, uh, half of the blockbuster um, uh, movies that have come out in the last 10, 15 years, 20 years, uh, have been about E.T. Uh, people want this to be the case, and sometimes I wonder again if it is an instinctive kind of uh, kind of connection with the reality that we know is out there, or simply just a desire. But in any case, it it has been imagined, 
uh, and it has been discussed and there have been some very kind of unfortunate events associated with it and uh, the, the uh, uh, Inquisition's uh, taking of Giordano Bruno being uh, a, a clear low point, uh, sometimes uh, feelings about this issue get very strong. So, uh, but there's now something new uh, to humankind. Uh, there's a, uh, you know, a real science of ET, and uh, it is, as I have come to understand it through my reporting, and I did go around the globe uh, roughly two times and tried to uh, really connect with uh, researchers out in the field, um, but what I've come to understand is that there is a large, it, it's almost like a stealth program going on. Uh, the, I, I'm not sure why it has not been brought together and, uh, and presented in the, in, the, in the vastness that it, it actually is, but across the world there are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, scientists, working on issues related to astrobiology. It's a, it's a broad discipline. It's not that people are astrobiologists per se, oftentimes. Uh, but it is a focus in a way that uh, I think, again, the public doesn't understand, uh, but that is a very important development in, in our time. Uh, and with, with that said, uh, I, I, there is new science that, is, that has been coming out over the last 10, 15 years, but most especially I would say in the last five years or so, uh, that really is changing our understanding of, of what is out there. Uh, and let me start with, with extremophiles, uh, which actually turn out to be in the news today. Uh, black smokers at the bottom of, uh, in particularly the Pacific, um, uh, hydrothermal vents with water coming out or, or um, that's 700 degrees or so. There's no microbial life right there, but very close to it. Uh, in, in some very high ranges, it's there. Um, before, before that was discovered, it was considered to be impossible. Um, you go down two miles in the Taylor Glacier, or uh, not two miles in the Taylor, but in, in, in the Taylor Glacier, or two miles down uh, Lake Vostok in Antarctica, and you're going to find microbial life in the ice. Uh, which again, I think most people would not under, not imagine to be the case, um, but it is now not only widely understood, but it's being studied as an ecological kind of community, that there are different kinds of microbes and that they serve different purposes, and they're found in virtually every um, very cold environment like that. Uh, I spent a lot of time talk, uh, thinking about and visiting um, the, the subterranean ex extra, uh, extremophile world. Uh, this is Tullus Anstadt, who, um, when he started, um, had absolutely no sponsorship um, and uh, gave his, used his own money to go over to South Africa, uh, where he had, just on the basis of a hunch and, and some of the initial work that he had done, he, he had um, surmised that there would be, or hypothesized, that there would be life well below the surface of the Earth. And um, by that, he, I mean miles below and that there would be microbial life and that it would have nothing to do with the surface of the Earth. And this was a pretty revolutionary idea at the time. I mean, certainly there's life at the bottom of the sea, but the, the idea that there would be life at the bottom of a mine uh, was something that was, it, it was, it was strange enough that he could not get a, a single person to finance him early on. Uh, he later did get um, help, help of various sorts, but that was uh, after coming up with what turns out to be among the most amazing and instructive, illustrative uh, microbes ever found. This is uh, De Sulfidorus uh, audax viator, the bold traveler, um, and there it is. Um, it lived, it, it was, it was uh, found, uh, I think it was about uh, two miles down, maybe not quite that, that deep, by uh, uh, by Tullus Onstad and uh, Linda Pratt, Lisa Pratt and, uh, a couple years ago. And what it does, what it's able to do, is survive in, in an environment that is totally dark, extremely hot, and that has no relationship whatsoever with the surface of the Earth. And hasn't for, they think, between three and four and, and 40 million years. Um, the th three is obviously an error bar that is giving them a lot of latitude there, but 
it, it, it's been for an extremely long period of time. It has, it has clearly evolved. Um, and it is, as far as we know, uh, something that's quite, that, that's unique, although there's really no reason to think that the same thing doesn't exist right below us. Uh, it just so happens that he was able to go into the deep mines of South Africa because that's where the mines were and they let him in. Uh, but the logic of what he found was that these, animal, th these creatures can exist in, in a world that is utterly disconnected from the surface and has been for a very long time. Um, I don't know if that picture works out that well, but uh, as, as a journalist and as a foreign correspondent, I of course saw this as a great opportunity to do the same thing uh, and went down, uh, went to South Africa and uh, went down to the Northam Platinum Mine. Uh, Tullus Anstott wasn't there, but some of his colleagues were. Uh, it, it was a fascinating experience, scary, very, very hot. Uh, we went down about um, a mile and a half, uh, and you're walking around in this environment that is extraordinarily hot, uh, but it also just appears to be utterly devoid of life. I mean, it's, you know, walking through a concrete jungle, although in this case it's granite or whatever, um, and be but because of what uh, Onstad and others have now found, we know that in the rock fissures, uh, you know, in the in pools deep inside the rock, uh, that there is life that's there. Uh, and it made it really quite eerie to be walking around there thinking, you know, that we were not alone. I was, you know, a mile and a half down, but I was not alone. Um, this is uh, what is just uh, the news today. Uh, this gentleman is uh, Gaetan Burgani. He's a nematodologist from Ghent, a, a, a university in uh, Brussels, I'm um, sorry, in uh, Belgium. He was one of the people who uh, I went down with. Uh, he was looking for complex life um, down that deep. That had never been found before. Uh, this is entirely new. I mean, and nematodes, it, it was understood, again, exist on the, the surface of the oceans quite deep, but not below, not, not, in the, not below the surface. Uh, on, um, on the ground here, it's generally understood that they live, or it w was understood that they live up to 25, 30 feet. Um, he was looking for them uh, at this one and a half to two miles. Uh, and he was using the same t kind of techniques, same technology, which was relatively simple. Uh, you go to a borehole, uh, you gather the water, and then you go back and filter it, and you try to find things. And lo and behold, this is one of the things he found. Uh, and and the, the, the journal article about this just came out today. Um, uh, this is its official name. I forget the first part, with it, but it is Mephisto. Uh, and thus the worm from hell. Uh, and um, this, this is not, I believe, this is not one that he actually found, but one that he grew from the others that he found. Uh, and uh, they, they, they did a, an enormous amount of work to, det uh, to protect against the possibility that this was contamination. Um, they went back many times. Uh, he, he has descended into the uh, mines, I think, about 25, 30 times, and a couple of them were after nature said, hey, you know, we're just not sure that this is really not contaminated. You have to go back. So he went back again and again, and he filtered, like, just tens of thousands of liters of water, and the, uh, the, the peer reviewers and editors at Nature were satisfied. And so this came out today saying, for the first time ever, we are finding complex life uh, at a depth that was perceived to be utterly impossible. So what's the importance of that for astrobiology? Um, this is a NASA image. Uh, it is, it is uh, saying something that perhaps, um, that I'm sure many of you know, that um, th there was a period of time when Mars was most likely uh, warm and, or warmer and wetter, um, that this was during the time when the Earth was clearly not habitable, um, and that it just may be that uh, Mars was habitable during that time. Um, and this is based on things such as um, the Phoenix finding of water below the surface, uh, I'm mean, sorry, of ice below the surface in the northern plains, um, the gullies that are found uh, in a lot of different places now, and, and deltas as well. Um, so there is this consensus, near consensus, of warm and wet. 
And then there's Mike Mooma's work on methane, um, uh, which is, again, truly remarkable. Uh, he has worked on this for 18 years. Uh, he's, he's, to my mind, one of the real giants of the field um, who went against a lot of what he was told could be the case. Uh, as it turns out, and this is something I chronicle in the book and tried to do this with a lot of the researchers that I, that I wrote about, um, did a little bit about his life. He grew up in Amish country outside of uh, Philadelphia. Uh, and when he was a young boy, uh, he was very kind of outgoing uh, and inquisitive guy, and he, um, well, he came into conflict with his pastor, who, had, who was someone he had been, who had gone to uh, see five days a week since he was born. Uh, and this was because at age 11 he had his first science class, and in science they told him about evolution and they told him about uh, things like, you know, how long uh, the world might have been here, and he went to the, speak to his uh, pastor, and the pastor said, well, that science teacher's wrong. You know, it's either, it's either kind of them or us. And instead of being kind of crushed by that, he used that as an energy that has led him to be kind of an out-of-the-box, unconventional thinker ever since. And I would have to say that that is something of a character trait, I think, of a lot of people in the field. That, uh, that they go into it um, being told that this is absolutely impossible, that these are things that cannot be. And then they work at it and work at it and work at it and do the hard science and boom. Uh, he is, what, what he discovered, and, it, and his colleagues, uh, was the presence of methane being emitted at specific places at specific times. Um, there had always been, you know, that there was a little bit of methane in the atmosphere, but there wasn't enough to make a big difference. Uh, and, but what he found was, was this pattern, which raises a lot of interesting questions. I mean, 90% of methane on Earth uh, is biological. Doesn't mean that this is biological, but you now have a, a scenario that makes a certain, you know, that, that could lead one to that conclusion. All right, to step back for a sec, uh, this is something, again, as a novice, I did not really know, but, uh, and, and a lot of this is relatively new information as well, but that everything that you need for life as we know it is out there, you know, and it's broadly out there. You know, you have complex hydrocarbons, these are polyaromatic um, uh, blah, 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 PAHs, uh, hydrocarbons, right? Uh, and, uh, and they are out there, nitrogen is out there, oxygen is out there, hydrogen is out there, uh, water is out there everywhere. So it's all there. And we now know uh, that there are like zillions of exoplanets. Uh, you know, we've identified uh, 500 and, and change and, and Kepler has found an additional 1,200 that are candidates. Uh, but uh, for, the, for the planet hunters who are out there, the Jeff Marcy's and Paul Butler's and, and others, it's, it's who have now written about this, and this is based on their extrapolation of the science, is that there is every, and Seth as well, there is every reason to believe that there are billions of exoplanets, that, that they are common, um, that, that uh, solar systems with multiple planets are common, that Earth-sized planets are common, that, uh, that planets in habitable zones are common. Now this is not stuff that has been entirely nailed down yet, but that's the direction that the science is going in, and I think Kepler's gonna tell us a lot more about that, and, and, a lot of, and, and some of the ground-based technology uh, uh, research as well. But this, to my mind, changes everything, because now you have a, a canvas uh, on which all those things can fall. All you know, the, the hydrocarbons and, and the, everything else that we were just describing, it's there. Um, no reason why it wouldn't fall there. In fact, we're sure that it did. And I'm not sure I have all my zeros right, but uh, this is how big the canvas is. I mean, as of today, you know, tomorrow you might have to add three more zeros to it. Um, I was speaking to Bill Baruki, who's the, the head of the Kepler program, and he said that when when he started out 10 years ago or so, uh, the assumption was that there were 100,000 stars in the Milky Way. He said now they're assuming 300, uh, three, uh, 100 billion stars. Now they're, uh, now they're counting 300 billion. 
So that's just, you know, you focus on something, you find out, and this is, this is what you're finding. So this is the canvas. We have all the material. We have life being phenomenally tenacious. And so this is the logic that, that I, that scientists, some of them in this room, helped me come to during my three years of reporting that life is more tenacious than previously imagined, that billions of exoplanets, habitable zones, probably common, molecules and compounds needed in the universe are everywhere. If life started once, why not again? And here's the one that really is the clincher. And this was, I, I, I am honored to say, I was in a conversation with uh, uh, Martin Rees, and he was the one who first brought it to my attention when he said, you know, just from a, it's not just probabilistic, but it's, it's from a, um, a, a, the point of view of physics, that if you have one genesis in our solar system, then it could be an anomaly. You can never tell. I mean, it's hard to explain, but it could be an anomaly. If it turns out that there is microbial life that, that has a different origin that's found on Mars or Enceladus or Titan or wherever else, then the probability that, th that life is a commonplace throughout the universe goes up like this. Uh, and so that's why all these microbes and this extremophile work and the methane work and all that is so important because it would, it would, it would take us over a hurdle that's a huge one. So uh, life that we'd like to find, obviously it's not going to be this. Maybe this, these are sn the famous snotties, uh, <laughs> bacteria from caves, uh, who knows. Um, but whatever life it is, uh, it, if, it's, if it's not the life that's in our solar system, it's going to be extremely far away. And this is where SETI and many of you folks in the, uh, uh, in the room come in. Um, if we have a situation where we know that there's microbial life that's, that's different than, or even complex life, that's different than Earth's on uh, Mars, then, and we know that the chances of there be, of life being a commonplace go up like that, how do we deal with that? How do we, you know, what sense do we make of it and how, how do we use it? Um, and I went into this um, as, I have to admit, and I feel awkward saying it in this room, a skeptic of SETI. Um, you know, I, I had, you know, as is often said, you know, maybe they've been looking for, you know, 40 some years and 50 years and, um, and haven't found anything. Uh, I had the opportunity to speak to, to Jill and to Frank and to Seth and others, uh, and I went up to Hat Creek, and I remember just walking around there uh, and being kind of overcome with the understanding that, you know, whatever the drawbacks are, this actually is the pathway that we have. You know, if, if we could get into a, a starship and go to Alpha Centauri, that would be great, but we can't. So. SETI is, is with, with all its imperfections, is, precisely, is something that is an essential part of the whole astrobiology picture, especially if we find life in our solar system, other life. Um, I also had the opportunity to, um, uh, to go to Japan and observe a SETI observation there. They had 23 different sites. Uh, this is Shinwa Nerosawa, uh, who hopes someday to be the Carl Sagan of Japan. I don't know, he's got a long way to go, but he, uh, he, he runs an observatory there. He's a charming guy uh, and, and is a great organizer. And um, after he did this, uh, he came to um, one of the, uh, the, the latest uh, Absicon gathering and spoke about his work uh, and then helped organize Project Dorothy, which was an international SETI with, what was it? 17, 16, 17 different sites, um, which says to me that there is huge interest out there, that there are a lot of different cultures, there are a lot of different peoples who would love to do this, uh, you know, who, who, who are, who are dr drawn to this concept. Now, he, here's my final point in all this. Um, after, his, uh, after his observation, and you can see there were a lot of, you know, reporters there, and, and it got quite a bit of publicity, um, he kind of, he went off into a corner, the phone started to ring, and it started to ring, you know, off the hook. And, you know, he would kind of be rolling his eyes and speaking in Japanese, so I didn't understand what he was saying, but after a while I could tell that this was not a particularly pleasant uh, conversation that he was having. And after maybe a half an hour, you know, a half a dozen or, or, or more calls, 
he came over and said, you know, whenever we have one of these things and, and we have the press, uh, I get all these calls with, from people saying, don't let them know we're here. <laughs> it's, it's dangerous, don't let them know. Now, of course, he's just listening, you know, they're, they're not going to let them know we're here. Uh, uh, but uh, that brings me to my final thought, which is, should we let them know? And, uh, and how are we going to get to the point where, where the, the search for extraterrestrial life has the same level of science as we're now, now finding it uh, in, in other areas? Uh, clearly, you know, Hat Creek and other, other advances mean that there's a great deal of terrific science going on in SETI, but I don't think that, I think it would be fair to say that it still is to some extent a matter of belief as to whether or not there is intelligent life out there. There's the Drake equation that will, that will lead us to a conclusion, but there isn't, there isn't specific data. Um, and it's, th there is, uh, yeah. <laughs> And uh, in that uh, absence of data, there is, or, or the, the sparsity of data, there is still a lot of room to wonder if there is something out there, is it bad? You know, is it malevolent? Is it good? You know, what should we do? And that's why the work that is done here, I think, is so important because it, it's helping to bring this also into the same level of science, into the same era, arena of science, and I think that it's on its way to doing that through OSETI and, and METI, you know, the messaging and whatever, um, and that it's just a matter of time before that same process is going to be, you know, the same level is going to be there. Um, and uh, as a final pitch, um, it's ridiculous that Hat Creek isn't working, don't you think? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's a great facility. It should be, it should be you know, five times bigger. Uh, if you know someone who has a real lot of money, just tell them to you know, write a check and bring it in. Here, here. There you go. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>
we don't use the word believe, and we do use the verb explore. If it were belief, if we were actually selling a religion, we could probably get this thing funded. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I hear what you say, and, and I thought a lot about that uh, last slide before, uh, before speaking here. Uh, it, it was one that I had used in some other venues, so I thought, well, you know, let's, let's do it here as well. Um, and what I was seeking to say was not that, um, that the search for, that you folks are involved in is akin to the belief systems of in, in religion, but it, it feels to me that um, the the scientific breakthroughs that have occurred in the worlds of extremophiles, in the worlds of exoplanets, of understanding what's uh, you know the elements that are out there um, in the uh, in the universe, is different than what unfortunately has happened here, which is that you've done a great deal, but there hasn't been a response. Um, so it's, maybe the, the use of the word belief was, uh, was ill-advised. It, um, it was, I, I was not trying to say that it was, you know, that, that this is a belief system at all, but that uh, there are, you know, half of the population that believes that there is life out there, but that is not based on the same kind of grounding of science, I think. Well, you know, you mentioned the 50 years and we have Frank to thank for the first uh, radio observation 51 years ago now. Um, but when you do the numbers, Mark, that 50 years is equivalent to saying, well, are there any fish in the ocean? Let's take an eight ounce glass and dip it in one of the oceans of the earth. And you know, are there's a, did I catch any fish? Are there fish in there? Well, that experiment could work. There are fish that would fit in the glass. But if you don't find any fish, I think you're not likely to conclude there are no fish in the ocean. Mm -hmm. But numerically, that's a really good analogy to what 50 years of being occasionally on the air looking for engineered signals is equivalent to. So we haven't done a lot. We can do a lot more with new technologies. We haven't yet done a lot. Right, and, and just on, on that ground, I, I totally agree with it, that, that, that this is something that, that uh, is extraordinarily valuable and should be done a lot more. Maybe it's worth pointing out, uh, maybe what you were getting at, actually. First of all, let me just preface this by saying most of Mark's book is actually about what you might say is conventional astrobiology. I hate to use the word conventional because that's somewhat, uh, that's discordant with this subject matter. but. Uh, <laughs> but not SETI. And as I look at this panel, all three of us are in this, <laughs> this SETI business, even though most of the people that work upstairs at this institute are actually doing what you would call astrobiology. So I think it's a little bit lamentable that we don't have the astrobiologist sitting up here. But what the astrobiologist might say, Jill, and obviously I will defend SETI to the hilt, but is that we do have some data from astrobiology. There's the, the methane evidence on Mars, for example, just to name one thing that Mark treats in his book. And while that has not conclusively proven that there are bacteria under the surface of Mars, that's a tantalizing thing, for which I'm not sure that we have a parallel in SETI yet. Okay. It's true that uh, so far we don't have any compelling evidence for any life beyond Earth yet, but at least the astrobiology people have some data to analyze, and that's maybe the difference. And, and the remarkable thing is that you know, one signal and then the game is entirely changed. Uh, and, and that isn't the case in some of the other astrobiology. So that's kind of a fascinating kind of spin on it. Yeah. Frank, um, uh, I had a question. Uh, the the, the uh, recent exoplanets findings um, that uh, Kepler has uh, you know, presented to us, do you think that they've been a game changer in the SETI search? Um, if you had have had this database of planets, back when you did Project Phoenix, uh, would this have changed your, uh, your approach? Yes. And I <laughs> 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 did, did you mean Phoenix or Osma? Either. Either. Uh, 
And I, I think the, the, these recent discoveries really do have to be taken into account and change greatly our search strategies. Up until now, we've been searching first uh, for signals from the vicinity of planets of stars like the sun, single stars. This was the belief uh, 50 years ago that the place to look was single stars like the sun. Uh, <clears throat> well, as time has gone on, in recent years, we realized that, in fact, the much more numerous kinds of stars, the red star, the red dwarf stars, they're called the M stars, are, have habitable zones too, and uh, could be potential abodes of life, and there are 10 times uh, more of those than there are star stars like our sun. So no longer should we just look at solar type stars. Uh, <clears throat> but then just in the last week or so, there's been a, a discovery which I think is, is really um, paradigm-changing, which is the discovery of uh, what I call rogue planets. I simply call them rock wanderers, nomads, planets that are not in orbit around any star. And uh, we <coughs> know from our modeling of the formation of planetary systems that uh, as they develop and their disks collapse into protoplanets and these become planets, there will be many close passages of these lesser objects which are on their way to becoming planets. And in these close passages, there is a mutual gravitational attraction, for sure, which we understand perfectly well. And this always results in one member of the pair that is passing one past the other, uh, one of them being accelerated, the other one being decelerated. So one of them goes faster, the other one goes slower. And these uh, chance, what we call collisions, they're not, they're close passages, uh, will occur in a random uh, sequence. And since it's random, occasionally some star will get accelerated over and over. It will just happen to pass with each, the other star with the right geometry that it is always accelerated. And you do this not many times, and you get the planet up to escape velocity. I mean, escape velocity from the planetary system, and it goes whooshing out into space. And in very little time, a few years, it has left that system and is no longer bound to it by the gravity, and it goes through the galaxy, essentially forever, as it turns out, without ever having a star to illuminate it, to heat it. And uh, the modeling indicates that the abundance of these things, or the number of these in our galaxy, uh, well, no, let me say it another way, that in every forming star, about one planet gets tossed out. And this means there should be a, as many of these things as there are stars in our galaxy. And this is true of other galaxies, too. Well, that is a quite a mind uh, paradigm changing thing. Because the next question you ask is, well, does it make any sense that there would be life on these that we might find? And your first thought is, good heavens, no, there's no starlight, no sun to, to, to power life, to uh, energize chlorophyll, to do all the things that makes life work very well in, on our Earth. But in fact, to have life is a thing we know, and that is what you need is basically not very many things. You need water it's life like ours, and of course, maybe there's many other forms of life. You need a source of energy, and you need carb uh, organic molecules, <coughs> hydrocarbons, that sort of thing. Well, these rogue planets, or nomads, whatever you want to call them, uh, have all these things, because they came, come from the same source, a disk of gas and dust, as did the planets of the solar system. So they've got the stuff of life. But what about the energy? Wait a minute, there's no star, no sun to shine a lot of energy on them. Well, it turns out planets are born with a great deal of energy in them. It's en energy of gravitational collapse, which uh, works to heat the interior of the planet as it forms and collapses under its own gravity. And it turns out the reservoir of energy created by this is enormous. Uh, we've seen that in our own solar system, in both Jupiter and Saturn, and actually uh, Neptune and Uranus, we believe. 
Uh, but clearly in Jupiter and Saturn, the amount of energy being released from those objects now after four and a half billion years is much greater than the energy they're receiving from the sun. Uh, in the case of uh, Jupiter, it's about twice. And this is, pardon? 25%, Jill says, okay. <laughs> uh, and <clears throat> this is uh, both leftover energy from the collapse of the object which made the planet, but also there is a huge source of energy which is radioactive decay of radioactive elements that are, are in these planets. Elements were created in the supernova explosion that enrich the galaxy with radioactive elements and, and delivered radioactive elements to every star in the galaxy. Well, maybe there's no 25%, I think one of them has 50%, I forget which. Uh, <clears throat> but if you ask the question, well, doesn't that mean these things get very cold? Well, it turns out that if the object is radiating only, say, 25% or uh, well, let's say 50% because I don't want to miss close to 50. 50% uh, of the energy that uh, Jupiter and Saturn are radiating, the object only cools down by 10 degrees in four and a half billion years. Now this is a long story, sorry it went on so long, but what this means is <clears throat> that these, these planets, even though the star has never shown on them since their very earliest days, are essentially the same temperature as Jupiter and Saturn are today. And that situation will occur with any planet that has a very deep atmosphere. Uh, well, when you have that deep atmosphere, there's another phenomenon, which is when, when you go down in an atmosphere, the temperature goes up. Uh, we see that everywhere. You go up a mountain, it gets colder. That's a result of very basic physics. And I, I won't go into that long story, just believe me. <laughs> you can ask me afterwards to explain that. It's easy to do. Uh, which means that uh, if you just go down in the atmosphere a little bit, you, you get temperatures in this room. And indeed, our radio telescopes have shown that in Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, there are levels in the atmosphere where the temperature is, as in this room, suitable for life. So there are actually habitable zones within planets, all of them, as long as they have a substantial atmosphere. And this means that even the rogue planets could have life. And this has been developed in great detail by some very eminent people like uh, David Stevenson at Caltech. Well, life, what will it be? What will it become? I will throw in one thing I've always emphasized whenever I teach astrobiology, when it comes to the biology, I'm not a great biologist, but there's one thing I can see clearly from what we know of biology, and that is one of the key qualities that make life so abundant and so effective is that it has two qualities which make it that way. One is that life is adaptive. It can adapt to conditions. As the temperatures on planets change, the chemistry changes, the amount of water and so forth, through what we call evolution, it adapts. The other one is that life is opportunistic. If there is a niche in which life can exist, it will get populated. Life finds a way. Life is very aggressive in a way. It survives, it adapts, but also it expands into every possible place where it could exist. So does that apply to the rogue planets? Uh, I think it will. Life will arise there. Uh, of course, it, probably, it will be bacterial life, you know, microbial life for sure. And then you ask the last question, and that is how far can it evolve? Well, to us, this, these are almost unthinkable places. You know, it's always dark. Uh, there may be a great deal of weather, but it's always dark. It's not cold, by the way, it's just dark. Would there be intelligent life there? Well. I think you have to fall back on this point that life is adaptive and opportunistic. And I would say if that applies throughout the universe, we're even going to find intelligent life there. There is a harder question. Will they have technology we can detect? But uh, there, you have to begin to speculate. 
I don't think I've been speculating up to this point. <laughs> but whether the creatures of a planet that's always in the dark um, may not, may have a difficulty getting fire. For real technology, you need fire too. Uh, but uh, knowing the history and the qualities of life, if I were betting on this, I bet that life has found a way to develop technology even in these places. Well, that's a long story, but it answers the question that uh, was first asked, which is what have we learned and how has it changed our search techniques? And what this says is we've got a problem. Uh, it could well be that the galaxy is just full of technology, life-bearing planets. We don't know what that technology is. Maybe they have radio. It's not ruled out by any means. But the problem now is that this life can be anywhere in the galaxy. It's not in orbit around nearby stars. Aiming your telescope at, at single stars in the sky uh, may be a very inefficient way to search. What you want, need to do is search the whole galaxy. So you change your search methods, and actually even the designs of your telescope so that they look at more of the sky at once instead of one star at a time. And this is the way to do SETI. Uh, it, uh, it also reminds us that a SETI success may take a very long time because now it's not, we're not limited to searching a small group of stars, but the whole sky. And that's a technological challenge for us or for any civilization. I'll stop there. Yeah, I, I might say two years ago, uh, Peter Goldreich, who's a theoretician at Caltech, was asked, he, he was giving a talk on this subject. Keep in mind, we haven't found any of these orphan planets, right? They're all theoretical, okay? But he was asked, he was asked, what, how many planets were in our solar system when it was formed? And his answer was about 40. Well, now we have eight, used to have nine, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that's one fifth. So that means that four fifths of all the planets are orphan planets. So that means instead of having a trillion planets in the galaxy, they're, you know, five trillion. Well, five trillion and one trillion are the same number for astronomers, but you might keep that in mind. <laughs> well, there is a recent report that we have seen rogue planets micro by gra gravitational microlensing, which Jill questions, although she's in a minority, I believe. <laughs> but uh, microlensing is a very powerful technique, which I'd like to talk about because I think it's the way you communicate and we're not able to do it, but there have been uh, microlensing uh, <coughs> detections of uh, uh, proposed detections of about 35 rogue planets in very little searching, and, and uh, in fact, uh, enough circumstances that the discoverers can predict the total number of rogue planets in the galaxy, and it works out to be 1.8 planets on average per per star, which means there are about twice as many rogue planets as there are stars in the galaxy, if those observations turn out to be okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I spent last week with a rival microlensing group. That's why I'm skeptical. <laughs> um, actually, Mark, you mentioned the seasonal heterogeneous methane in the Martian atmosphere. Seth, you mentioned the methane as well. I'd love some of our astrobiologists in the audience to, to address, okay, you know, is it this uh, serpentization of olivine? Is it microbes? Where do we, what, what are people thinking? Since you wrote your book, which is yeah. a little while ago now, and things move on. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a guess, I guess uh, I'm a Martian uh, astrobiologist. <laughs> I'm going to kick the ball along, though, because we actually have a talk from Kevin Zarnley, who recently published a paper suggesting that the Martian methane signatures that Mike Wilmer had detected might, not, might have been somewhat questionable. Um, so it's an ongoing debate, and uh, the question will be answered in two parts by the Mars Science Laboratory that lands next year on Mars, and that is sensitive to methane, so wherever it lands, it will get very good uh, parts per billion detections of methane on the surface where it lands. And then we have the Trace Gas Orbiter mission that is launching in 2016, where they will also do a very sensitive search for methane. Uh, and 
directly ascertain whether Mike Woomer's uh, detections, which he had to do extremely uh, exacting science and spectroscopy to look through Earth's atmosphere, which has plenty of methane, and just look at the methane that was on Mars. Um, it's a very difficult measurement and um, it may be that we really have to get the final result from sending a direct methane detection mission to Mars. And, and that, was, that was certainly my understanding as well, and I think that, that, that Mike would agree. Um, I, I, I recall after going down to Paranal with, uh, with Mike, he, I, I spoke with um, uh, Ed Weiler, and this was just during the time when it was, they were deciding on the ExoMars uh, architecture, and it was his, what he told me was that he felt that the science was strong enough that it deserved for them to change their architecture. And, but th that, the underlying understanding though is that we really still don't know. We actually might start with questions from the audience. We have one from the uh, Actually, two quick comments. First of all, thanks for, for a great talk, Mark, and for a great panel. Uh, the, the first comment is about uh, Jill's question about the methane on Mars. It, the simple answer, of course, is we don't know. Methane can be produced either through geologic activity or through biologic activity, but the important thing is that it's through activity. And that says that Mars is an active planet. It is not a dead planet. Whether it's alive geologically or biologically or both is the really interesting question, and there are some things that could be done. For example, measuring the carbon-12 to carbon-13 ratio uh, in the methane. Uh, which Mars Science Lab in principle is capable of doing, and if you start seeing interesting things, certainly geologically produced methane on Earth has a different carbon-12 to carbon-13 ratio than biologically produced methane on Earth. So there's an interesting measurement. The other comment was that we do have one datum that potentially provides some information that distinguishes the potential for microbial life on other planets from the potential for intelligent life on other planets. And that one datum is that microbial life started on Earth very early, certainly within the first billion years of Earth's history, but maybe much sooner, much earlier than that. And it took four and a half billion years to get to a technological civilization. That doesn't mean that one is easy and one is hard, or one is likely and one is unlikely, but at least there is a line of argument that says, well, it might mean that microbial life is common and intelligent technological life maybe isn't so common. Any comments? Hi, thank you. Has anyone worked out a corollary to the direct equation that indicates how likely we will find life out there? It would encapsulate maybe the how and the where we should look. Do you want to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> Guess I'm stuck with that one. <laughs> uh, the Drake equation can be used to produce exactly the results you want to find. The problem is that to do that calculation, you need to know something about the potential technology in its abundance that we would find, and we do not know that at all. Uh, we, uh, in particular, there's, there's one factor in the equation, which is the length of time a civilization is detectable. And the idea there is that, uh, sure enough, when you develop the first really powerful radio transmitters, they're exploited, and, uh, and you need powerful ones because the receivers are not as good yet, and as a result, you have to transmit a lot of power into space, and that makes you detectable. But as our civilization is showing, as time goes on, uh, the, power, the uh, quality of uh, radio receivers improves, and the receiving um, systems and uh, coding methods work so that you don't need to transmit much power to successfully communicate or to do radar successfully, and as a result, as technology improves, a, a planet uh, gradually becomes fainter, in a way. And how long that takes place is the big mystery. 
Uh, we're afraid to use ourselves as an example. We're, uh, clearly, there will be different rates of decay or growth in technological civilization. It depends on things like politics and abundance of uh, certain materials in the planet and such. Uh, and also it depends on even sociology because uh, one way a planet might stay detectable, this, I'm giving you one example, of, it might stay detectable very much longer, is if they build solar power stations in space. These have been designed, there's one actually being built now, where, where solar panels, just like the ones on people's houses, are put into orbit in huge numbers with a total collecting area of, say, several square kilometers. Take several square kilometers, you can produce as much power as a nuclear power station, and the power is transmitted to Earth on a microwave to uh, big antennas on the ground. And the big antennas on the ground are about a kilometer in size also. And this is all feasible. We could do this right now. No problem. Uh, there's a long, big question about the uh, financial question. Is this really f financially superior to just building more nuclear power stations or whatever? Uh, <clears throat> however, if those are become the prime source of power, and it's a good source if you do it, it's clean power, non-polluting, and all the rest. It's so totally renewable. Uh, uh, if this is used, it turns out no matter how good you build a radio antenna to collect the radiation that's sent down from the, the uh, solar power station, a little bit's reflected. There's no such thing as a perfect antenna that captures everything. Uh, and, and typically they, they, they return to space 1% or so of the power that falls on them. You know, that's, and it, that's a very efficient antenna. Well, the typical power station as we're think, talking about here would generate and transmit a power of, of about a, a gigawatt, 10 to the ninth power watts. One percent, which is what would be returned to space, is uh, <coughs> uh, 10 million watts, which is stronger than any transmitter we have now running on Earth. That power's all lost, it's wasted, but it's uh, trivial compared to what the system is, is producing. So th there's that scenario, and whether that happens or not, we don't know, or how often it happens, we don't know, and there are probably other scenarios. And so the end result is we can't answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> can, can, can I say something? Did, did you ask about intelligent life or just finding life in space? I, I, uh, let's make that intelligent. Oh, okay, I thought you said life in space because Mark and I were talking about this this afternoon a little bit. And something that may get lost in the plethora of news stories that you read about astrobiology, and sometimes you're not even aware that they're about astrobiology. And they talk about a new planet that might possibly be in the habitable zone or whatever, right? And you can impress your neighbors by knowing what a habitable zone is. Uh, m the neighborhood I live in is not one, for example. <laughs> but what we're talking, the, the facts are that all of these fall into three categories. There's kind of a three-way race to find life in space. And one of, one of the horses in that race is SETI, obviously. A second horse in that race is simply to find it nearby. That's what NASA and the European Space Agency and so forth are doing. You know, send probes, send robotic probes, send people, whatever it takes, to places like Enceladus, to Titan, to uh, the three moons of Jupiter that are suspected of having liquid water. Send them to Mars, obviously. And that's the second horse. And the third horse would be to send up something like the Terrestrial Planet Finder, all of which has been designed, but unfortunately it's currently comatose for lack of funding, but that would be able to, to detect oxygen or methane in the atmospheres of planets around other stars. Now each of these stars, uh, sorry, each of these horses has what seems to me a priori a more or less equal chance of success. Obviously I'm giving SETI the same a priori chance as these other schemes and maybe I shouldn't do that, but I, I do. What is the time scale for any of these? It depends entirely on funding. Right? And so, being conservative, I'd say within 20 years, one of these horses may cross the finish line. So maybe that's some sort of answer to you. And I usually bet people a cup of Starbucks that it'll happen. But. <laughs> if you have questions, just raise your uh, hand and then we'll come around. Uh, uh, there's someone behind you. Yeah, you have to wait for the microphone. Um, is anybody... Um, SETI or any other organization looking for any clues other than radio signals? Because what if there's life, but they just haven't gotten to the point of creating 
radio signals. I mean, what if it's like a civilization of the Romans or something, you know, where they're intelligent beings, but they don't have the technology to transmit? Well, SETI actually uses technology as a proxy for intelligence, right? We, we can't detect intelligence per se at a distance. We all know that you're intelligent because you came here tonight to listen <laughs> to this talk, right? We can infer that. But um, in terms of remote detection, technology becomes our proxy for intelligence, and therefore there is an entry-level technology below which we are not sensitive because we're talking about something that can modify its environment in ways that can be sensed over interstellar distances. So campfires or um, uh, Roman uh, warfare technologies aren't detectable, at least not with our 21st century technology over interstellar distances. So there is something that's happening right now in addition to radio. We're looking for optical signals that are obviously engineered. And what that turns out to mean is optical signals that are short pulses, bright flashes, something that might be produced by a laser focused by a big mirror. Um, that kind of signal, an optical flash that lasts only a billionth of a second, as far as we know, nature can't make that. And just like the radio signals we're searching for are compressed in frequency, again, because nature can't seem to do that trick. So right now, early stages, even though it's been 50 years, it probably is early stages of this SETI endeavor, and we're looking for the easy artifacts. We'd like to take the optical and move it into the infrared when the technology becomes affordable because the um, optical light is scattered and absorbed by dust between the stars. And so you get limited partway through the galaxy. But if you go into the infrared or in the radio, those signals are not obscured and they can travel long distances. So we're trying those things. But, you know, one thing that you didn't mention tonight is that we, we're trying to use the technology of the 21st century to find someone else's technology. But they may be sending zeta rays. <laughs> and we haven't a clue what zeta rays are. And so there's a bit of this game, which is you need to survive as a technological civilization long enough, that is we do, in order to invent zeta rays and then decide, oh, that's really good for communication. Let's search for that. So you do what you can. You can't ever quite bet on the fact that they're going to have um, an institute of ancient instruments <laughs> and be transmitting specifically for the purpose of attracting the attention of emerging technologies. But they might. That might be what we find. Rather than leakage radiation, it might be a deliberate attempt to attract our attention. I think it's a very interesting question whether you could detect the Romans. You think about yeah. what was the biggest thing that the Romans built, and maybe it was Hadrian's Wall. It's a long linear feature. But, and if you had a telescope that had a mirror, more or less the size of the solar system, our solar system, and, and that's expensive, that's not in NASA's budget for next year. But if, you know, in, in principle, you could resolve something like that. But I, probably a better signal would be the, uh, the way the Nile was controlled every year. You know, they're growing the grain to feed Rome in Egypt. And, you know, you had this big expanse of uh, chlorophyll. Chlorophyll turns out to be something that you can detect spectroscopically from space. So, so maybe if you really had a really good telescope, you might see that seasonal change as they're growing uh, the uh, food that was sparingly fed the populace of Rome. But better to wait 2,000 years till they have radar. <laughs> <laughs> Does it work? Okay. Uh, I was wondering about funding from government sources, which is an ancient history here, but uh, it's still a major force, source of funding for the astronomical community through the National Science Foundation, as I understand it. But in the last uh, list of projects that they were supporting, I did not see SETI even mentioned. Uh, isn't it possible to get it in there, slip it in there somewhere? 
with all the billions that they're spending on this new space telescope and all the other projects. Well, um, the uh, I think both within NASA and within NSF, and by the way, NASA funds a lot more astronomy than NSF. <coughs> the budgets are just a lot bigger. Um, I think all of our colleagues are going to be facing a really difficult decade. The, uh, the priorities that have been placed on our budget, which is suffering from such a large deficit, um, have not been such that the astronomical sciences are going to be very well favored. Um, it will be nanotechnology, it will be information technology, biotechnology. Um, I think astronomy is looking at a flat um, budget. So the, um, the Allen Telescope Array was actually mentioned in the decadal survey uh, for astronomy and astrophysics for this next decade as a pathfinder to a larger radio telescope called the Square Kilometer Array, which if ever built would also do SETI extraordinarily well. So. Um, we have to come up with some mix of federal and private funding and endowed funding that has the ability to smooth out this roller coaster that we've been riding for 50 years. There, there's also kind of the um, emergence now, obviously, of the commercial space sector and it's unclear what role they will play in terms of serious science uh, as opposed to you know, just ferrying people back and forth to the space station. But I know that um, there was a symposium recently at uh, MIT and some of the people came out of that uh, feeling that the, uh, the commercial space folks uh, were inclined, were interested in, in doing science. And at, at the very least, they hopefully in the future will be able to get um, observatories up into space much more cheaply than what happens now. I want to <coughs> put out just a few brief comments. Uh, one is uh, we have had many programs for the last 10 years searching for optical flashes uh, of the kind Jill described. Uh, one is only one is really in full operation now which is a very powerful one at Harvard University. We here at SETI Institute had one of the best and it ran for 10 years. We looked at 6,000 stars without seeing a flash, but that's not discouraging. That one has gone into hibernation just the way, for the same reasons as the Allen Telescope Array, which is very sad. It's a very inexpensive program, and yet we can't do it. And elsewhere in the world, it's the same story. So we are looking in other ways when we can. Through, through whatever part of the spectrum that you're looking at, one presumes that the signals come to Earth and fly by rather quickly. Is it realistic to look for a reflected signal that might be older, coming back from some foreign source, so that you could see it a second time? I think, I think there's an easy answer to that, and that is that reflections uh, cause the signal to be weakened by the fourth power of the distance to the between you and the whatever is transmitting the signal. And it just makes them very unlikely. They're just so weak that they, if you put any realistic numbers into reflected signals, you just can't detect them. So that, uh, that is not promising. Try, try aiming a flashlight at a ball bearing 10 miles away. See how bright it is. Just me. Um, would your system uh, for detecting radio signals detect a spread spectrum? signal that was generated in that way at the other end? Um, indeed, the analog portion of the system would. The digital portion right now is programmed to look for narrowband artifacts. We are actually conducting a program called SETIQUEST looking for new algorithms to detect different kinds of signals. We're we've been supporting research into what happens to such noise-like spread spectrum wideband signals 
as they traverse the interstellar medium and are um, scattered and dispersed. And we're trying to see what the interstellar medium tells us about the best communication channel. If you're gonna send a broadband spectrum, uh, a broadband signal, what kind of signal, what kind of modulation, what frequency range, higher is probably better. So we're looking at what would be good and with enough compute power, we can start looking for that kind of thing. Okay, we'll go for a couple more questions and then we'll go to the Stephen Colbert video. <laughs> I don't wanna come very far between us and Stephen Colbert. Um, I, I am kind of curious, how visible it would Earth be if to a SETI program out there somewhere? It, th this has been asked a lot, and the question is, how far away could we <laughs> see Earth with our SETI equipment? And that depends on what you're looking at. If you're looking at, for example, the leakage from uh, television, <coughs> FM radio, and other high-powered, high-frequency transmitters, then it turns out you can't see it very far. Even if you use the biggest antennas on Earth, you might see it at typically a distance of a light year, which isn't even the distance to the nearest star. So that's not terribly promising. However, however, the radars are much more powerful, right? And in fact, something like the Arecibo radar, every time Frank and I do this calculation every three weeks just, uh, you know, for fun. And <laughs> <laughs> but it's becoming less fun. But, but it, <laughs> and you know, that's a, what, two megawatt transmitter on a, you know, thousand foot diameter antenna. If you happen to have the good fortune that somebody is aiming Arecibo at you and you're trying to find it with Arecibo, then you can see it, my calculation says 400 light years, he says 1,000 light years. That's a factor of two which doesn't count in astronomy as we've already established. <laughs> so at, at, at that point, that's, that's a significant distance. Uh, there was a claim a couple of years ago that a telescope being built in Europe called LOFAR, which consists of a series of very low frequency antennas, very simple things, just wires and things that'll trip up the local population in Holland and Germany. That, the, these antennas are spread throughout, sorry? The bicycles. Well, <laughs> that's right, also the cows, so there are more cows than bicycles. Uh, uh, spread throughout Europe. That operates at frequencies that are used by television, FM radio, and so forth. And the question is, uh, could they, in fact, find the equivalent of I Love Lucy coming from other star systems? And you can do that. that th there, was, there were stories in the papers that it could, because there were some claims made by people at Harvard, but it was only Harvard, uh, that, that that might be possible. But in fact, they're off by many orders of magnitude from being able to do that. However, I, th I think the bottom line here is a very simple statement. It's only been 100 years since Marconi, right? And it might have been 100,000 years since their equivalent of Marconi. So I wouldn't judge too severely our capabilities based on what we can do in the transmitting area. I would add a cheery note to Seth's comments, and that is there is a technology we don't have yet which is possible and would make it very easy to detect planets like our own with no effort at all, including I Love Lucy. I hope enough of this audience is old enough to know what that, really well, yeah, <laughs> what, 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 what that analog is. Uh, anyway, and that, that this is to use our sun as a lens. Uh, this has been shown to work. Uh, that's how a large number of extrasolar planets have been detected. Stars focus light, just like a lens, and it's an incredible lens. It's a lens that is the diameter of the sun, so you can just imagine. And unfortunately, uh, we know exactly how all this works. It's all based on general relativity, no funny business. Uh, unless you consider that funny. <laughs> uh, the problem with the gravitational lens is the focal point is at a distance which is 500 times the distance from the Earth to the Sun. You have to put your receiver out there and we don't have the technology to do that. Uh, well, actually we do, but we can't afford it and it's, uh, it's a difficult project. It takes decades to get your system out there. But once you get it out there, you've got uh, the ability to detect incredibly weak signals. And I personally think this is in our future, and it has been in the future of every civilization that developed technology. And we're just 100 years behind. I, I have to follow up on this, because Mark asked, actually, before the panel discussion today, should we talk about METI, which is, in other words, should we talk about broadcasting? Because it's a very controversial thing. Should we, in fact, broadcast anything? Uh, this, this is kind of an answer to the danger in broadcasting. 
because if you're worried about broadcasting, it's too late. We've been broadcasting since the Second World War. And the point is that any society that has the capability to come here and ruin your whole day by, you know, devastating the Earth or something similar, right? They have the capability of certainly going 500 astronomical units from their planet, setting up this gravitational lens telescope, and then they can pick up not only I Love Lucy, they can pick up the street lamps from Philadelphia. Okay, so that signal, that horse has left the barn. There's no point in worrying about it. 500 AU is about where? Well, 500 AU, 500 AU it's, it's like 30 to 50 AU to Pluto. So it's 10 times farther than Pluto. You could get there in, in a century and a half with the rockets we can build if you have enough you know, TV dinners. <laughs> uh, I was a little interested in the potential downstream implications of the Drake equation. If everything is tremendously successful, and perhaps you can actually get good evidence that of maybe a billion civilizations that have intelligent life. However, what are the possibilities that any of them, maybe two of them, would know about each other? Can you make any estimates of that? Because it seems to me that if there was two, then there would probably, there would seem to be a good chance of there being like maybe 10, because once two civilizations could get in touch with each other, and the chances aren't great because of their technological <coughs> lifetimes and everything. But at some point, with such a huge number, potentially, of intelligence civilizations, some of them have to get in touch with each other and have some sort of conversation. And, and if that's true, then suddenly these colossal numbers, don't they work the other way around? Yes. <laughs> that's, a <simple> <laughs> that, that's a good analysis. You know, it's all right. Hi. Uh, first, a quick comment. I uh, tweeted Jill's comment about um, uh, funding in religion versus science, and a friend responded suggesting that if you change the name from extraterrestrial to sky people, you might get a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, is your friend willing to write a check? <laughs> Sadly, he doesn't make any more money than I do. Uh, but um, a, a question that is somewhat speculative in nature. Um, when when I, I step back and I think about SETI and everything from Project Ozma on up, it's uh, all of the science trying to detect an artificial case of something that occurs naturally, an artificial signal of electromagnetic radiation that occurs, that is differentiated um, by statistics or other analysis from a natural. And I was wondering if you would, the panel would like to speculate a little bit in the future, you know, what other kinds of technologies that maybe we haven't thought of that an advanced civilization might be using to manipulate the universe that me, we might be able to detect an artificial example of that from uh, a natural example, I'm thinking something like maybe m manipulating gravity waves or, you know, once they're proven to exist and things like that. <laughs> well, well one, one bit of SETI that is being done, I mean, you, you can do SETI by looking for signals. You can also do SETI by looking for artifacts, right? You could, uh, a la, you know, 2001, you could go dig up the moon and see if there are any monoliths buried there. Not that you learn a whole lot from a monolith, by the way. Uh, but, but it calls home. It calls home. Well, there, there's something. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But there have been, there have been, if you will, some uh, parasitic SETI experiments. There's a guy in, in Illinois, Dick Kerrigan, who sifts through infrared data from telescopes, which are surveying the infrared sky for reasons that have nothing to do with SETI. And he's just looking for star systems that have too much infrared. Because if they have too much infrared, maybe they are surrounded by a Dyson swarm, a swarm of, you know, solar collectors. Uh, because this is a civilization that, you know, that needs a lot of energy to you know, support their gusto-grabbing lifestyle, okay? So that's one way you can do it. The other thing, that I just throw this out to provoke you, is that if you think of where we're going, the trajectory that we are going to follow, we invented radio 100 years ago, we invented computers 50 years ago, and in another 100 years we may invent thinking machines, okay? 
And for thinking machines, the thing is not to make big stuff, but to make small stuff. As Richard Feynman said, there's a lot of room at the bottom. In other words, there are many more magnitudes of scale going below the size of a human than above the size of a human, at, at least you know, in terms of what we can engineer. Okay, so that maybe, in fact, the future for us is, in fact, devices that are very small and that are not so easy to find at a great distance. That's just to provoke you. Actually, another answer to your question is the fact that if you're thinking about a deliberately generated signal, we've been talking about things that are obviously engineered. So we go for the artifacts as opposed to the spread spectrum which looks more noise-like. Um, how about a deliberately engineered signal that looks almost natural? So that when an emerging technology begins to develop the tools to study their universe and begin to make surveys of the number of pulsars or to look with transit telescopes for exoplanets, um, they might discover, and it's going to be some graduate student or postdoc who's going through a huge database, a pulsar that was caught in the survey and one week when it was detected it had one period, the next week it had another period, and then it went back to the first period. It shows up in the survey, it gets <laughs> captured by the data, but it takes the researcher looking for anomalies to pull that out. And the transit detections. Um, in fact, there is a lot of information as a planet goes into the limb of a star and egresses from the limb of the star. A lot of higher order uh, harmonics, which can distinguish a big artificial Venetian blind or triangle shape from a round planet. So you could engineer this thing and people looking for extrasolar planets would discover your artificial planet. People have suggested you could make, take Cepheid variables and, and shorten the next period and actually come up with a pulsing, a, 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 um, a Morse code, a regular period and a short period. And Cepheid variables are, you know, you can see them uh, to the next galaxies. Right? So by, by doing astronomy and exploring the natural universe and just remembering that some anomaly might in fact be an indication of some astroengineering is another way of doing SETI. Okay, we're, we're going to uh, close down the, uh, the uh, questions from the audience, but if you do have further questions, we will have Mark and the other panelists will stay around at least a couple of hours. I know it's probably <laughs> Seth's bedtime right now. Probably Seth's bedtime right now. But, uh, <laughs> Seth, if you could stick around for 15 minutes. So. Mark, um, we've heard a lot about communicating science and astrobiology to the public and the difficulties with funding and stuff like this. In, in writing your book, as a final question, in writing your book, what sort of insights uh, have you uh, garnered about communicating the science of astrobiology to, uh, to the public? Uh, first and foremost is that people involved in it really want to get the story out. And, and that's a, a wonderful thing for a reporter and, and I think is, you know, speaks well of the endeavor in, in, just in general. Um, the, uh, the other real significant point, uh, the consistent point, is that, is that the public is really interested. Uh, I write stories for the Post and, and now we can, we can measure you know, how many hits we get on, on, on stories and um, it, it's extremely um, popular, and not, not popular, people are really interested. I mean, like the story I did today about the, the nematodes being found um, you know, quickly went to be the most popular one on our website. Um, it didn't decline, but you know these things happen. Uh, it had to do with Sarah Palin, I think. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, but but the, the basic bottom line is that is that this this these are issues that real that um, that move people, and that they want answers, and that you know they're they're eager to get involved in it in some way. Uh, they're not necessarily sure how to connect to it, but. Um, 
just that. Uh, Mark is a uh, token of our gratitude for you coming along today. We have a, an antique SETI mug. I'll have to um, convince you that it's there in the box. Um, <laughs> it. Please do, yes. And uh, please join me in thanking Mark and the panel for their great talk to you.